Start the recording. All right. Action. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a first for the uh, for the uh, Shinomo user group here because we're going to have two presenters tonight. So we've got Nicholas and we've got Oscar. And uh, again, thank you very much to uh, SP Arch for uh, hosting us tonight um, and uh, partners here for this wonderful spread that we've got. Um, and beautiful space and we finally have some nice weather so we're excited about that and i won't yammer on anymore take it away because i forgot to bring my little sheet to read your description you sent me so i'm oh, yeah. just going to let you do it okay so okay. please okay thank you um, i'm oscar hello everybody uh, i came to she and partners in december of 2016 so i've been here only a couple months i came by way of perkins and will uh booth hansen and lucien lagrange so that's my little spiel i won't take up too much time yeah, uh, Nick Martz. I've been here for a couple years. Uh, I came on as the director of design technology, so you know, getting Revit in place, standards in place for technology, pushing the VR as much as we can. Um, yeah, it's a great place to work. I like it a lot. I do a lot of cool buildings. I have not you memorized. Can you have you jump yeah. over there then, so that so oh, yeah. everybody's kind of this way. Sure. Okay. Um, I have not memorized the. Uh, Elevator speech for the firm. Yes. Yeah. So I have notes. I apologize. <laughs> so the firm was founded in 2004. Uh, we specialize in uh, technically challenging projects for corporate and development clients. Our work includes data centers, training floors, mission critical facilities, uh, as well as corporate interiors and renovation projects. Our clients are Equinix, uh, Microsoft, and uh, Facebook. I would say the most famous project from the firm, in my opinion, is this one in Sweden from 2016. It's the Lulia uh, data center. I believe uh, Facebook is the client. Uh, we also use uh, VR a great deal here at the firm. Uh, we usual, uh, utilize Autodesk Revit. Our hardware is the Oculus Rift. We also use Revitso and Enscape, and as well as 3ds Max. Uh, we have a station for you guys after this meeting is over if you guys want to check out some of the work uh, you can speak to Errol who's sitting here raise your hand Errol uh, he's our he's our guy for that uh, Dr. Viz, Dr. Viz. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, this is our logo I want to thank Lauren for our great logo she's sitting in the back there <laughs> uh, uh, we are the Spark Dynamo studio uh, uh, just a, just one one set of ground rules before we get started uh, I cannot give you these three pieces of information, so I cannot give you the name and the location and the client's name. So we will offer one of those to you, and we just ask that you don't, you know, push us on giving you more information, because I will have to say no, <laughs> and I don't like to say no. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Nick because he is the expert. You're going to get a crash course so in expert. data centers. Yeah, actually, there's people who have been here longer than me in the company, so. Maybe they'll chime in too, but yeah, little data center 101. Uh, the core program of a data center uh, is up there on the screen. We have sort of the fun space, is kind of a way to think about it. You know, the admin space. Um, our clients, they are Facebook, Microsoft. You know, they're very big corporate clients. They're trying to get the best of the best engineers in their facilities, so they really give us a lot of leeway on the design of the admin. So that's where we put our design focus. And I think we do a really good job of making the data centers look fun and inviting because they are, the data centers themselves are big warehouses that store servers, you know, and there's air management and they're highly technical, but they are big boxes essentially. So that's where we get our design uh, opportunities here in the administration centers. Um, uh, one more. Oh, it's not. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, you get an idea of the spaces. You know, Facebook, they have game rooms, uh, kitchens, you know, corporate kitchens in there, really fun spaces uh, to work. The data centers themselves look really good, too. You know, we put a, a good uh, emphasis on design uh, inside the data halls as well. Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. So, there, there's a typical. Uh, MDF, looking at the main distribution, um, you know, this is a typical shot down the server hall, um, all the infrastructure above, 
Uh, again, you know, highly technical, lots of wire management. Uh, we have all kinds of engineers above and beyond MEP. You know, there's technology engineers. Uh, they're heavy on security. A lot of security coordination goes into a lot of this. Um, and they're prototypes as well. So we see a lot of the same build outs for the data halls over and over. So that's, you know, I won't steal Oscar's thunder, but that's why we're starting to lean towards Dynamo to get a lot of these projects going. Um, so that's the, you know, the networking, the core IT. There is also uh, a penthouse, if you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So the mechanical systems, uh, Facebook really pushes, uh, the PUE is the power use efficiency. Uh, the lower that number is, it's usually about 1.5 on average. Uh, Facebook gets to 1.06. A lot of these are very passive systems. Uh, you know, air coming through water filtration to cool the air down through fan walls to push the air into essentially the, the balloon of the data hall. So all that is very passive, very low energy. Data centers themselves take a wild amount of energy off the grid. So, you know, we're really trying to bring that PUE down. Um, so some clients do better than others. Uh, you can go into the client types as well, but so penthouse mechanical space usually above the data hall, pushing the air management down. Heavy, heavy mechanical systems. Um, before this, I was at MW. We did semiconductors and uh, you know heavy technical facilities, and they were very similar types of uh, of buildings. Uh, huge chiller plants, huge electrical rooms, um, like 30 megawatt facilities, you know, um, Champaign, Illinois is 36 kilowatts for the entire town of Champaign, Illinois. This one H prototype takes 30 kilowatts. So, you know, again, anything we can do to curb just a little bit of energy goes a long way in these mechanical spaces. Uh, electrical spaces, you know, kind of, same kind of spiel, just a wild amount of electricity coming into these things, giant uh, substations going into these giant electrical rooms, you know, stepping the electricity down little bits at a time, but little bits in, you know, 450 watts and things, volts, I should say. There's always generator yards. Uh, this is an Equinex facility. So Equinex is a colo data center that's a facility. So there's enterprise data centers. That's Facebook, Microsoft. They build their own data centers for themselves because we can't put enough cat pictures on the internet. We need all those servers to hold all that stuff on Facebook. This is a colo data center, uh, Equinex. They rent out small, what they call cages. They're very high end, you know, metal perforated enclosures. They look really nice. We'll see, I think we'll see some images of those. But you uh, essentially rent a 20, usually about 20 foot by 40 foot, what they call cage. And they supply all the electricity, the uh, air management, uh, they give, give you all the infrastructure you need, and it's guaranteed 100% uptime. So these generator yards work in, so, so you're working on the grid, you know, you're every day, you're just using Comet or whatever to get your electricity. If Comet goes down, there's battery rooms that can power that entire facility for up to two minutes. Inside that two minutes of window time, those generators that you're seeing there that are the size of usually semi-trucks, are kicking in, they're, they're firing up, they're getting their diesel engines going, they stabilize the facility, batteries shut off, then they're, they're running on generators. Those generators are usually sized, it depends on you know how, there's different tiers of data centers, um, it really depends on, on what tier you're at, but uh, there's usually, they call it three to make one, one backup for every two generators, they can run for about 72 hours. There's also water contracts, basically you're, buying the fact that you're never going to lose any electricity. You'll, you know, Bank of America is not going to go down with their facility in here. People in, in Yahoo, Facebook, they have cages inside these facilities because they can interconnect. You know, the internet is essentially a bunch of wires interconnecting themselves and this is a quick way for them to interconnect. So it was a long-winded uh, generator yard slide, but you know, the, the infrastructure is, is really heavy in these uh, facilities. And then the data halls themselves, uh, there's always some kind of containment system. You're, you're looking right at a hot aisle containment in this case. Uh, you know, uh, cool, air, cool air comes down through that chimney, pushes through the servers back into the space, and then some returns back, some exhausts out of the building, but 
um, pretty sort of straightforward as far as air management goes. You know, you're just blowing cold air somehow across the servers to keep them cool. So there's an Equinix facility. That's you're looking at a you know set of cages. Um, some people look more organized than others. They don't care what you do inside that facility. It's 365 days. Uh, you know, always 24/7. You can get in there anytime you want. Once you're inside your cage, you can do whatever you want. More of the data hall. You know, uh, you're seeing all the different cable trays, the different networking systems above. Um, some some different electrical equipment inside the data hall. Another one of the uh, the cage facilities themselves. From the perspective of the model, because obviously these are very, very um, intricate and, and jam-packed models, we do manage, uh, obviously, uh, an all model, which is what I've labeled here, but also the the pipe model for, you know, if there's going to be water coming into the building. Uh, we also organize and manage a structural model. Obviously, these, these pieces of equipment are very heavy, and the electrical model gets very heavy as well. Uh, we manage all of the overhead pieces and all of the um, all of the you know coordination for those pieces. The mechanical model and really this gets at sort of the first task that I was given when I started the the, the Dynamo roadmap here. Uh, we have this very, very, in, this very, very small model. It's not a very complicated building, but it's just jam packed in one area. And so, when we originally had uh, this conversation, Nick and I, for the the roadmap for what uh, what we would do with Dynamo, uh, when I got here, there was no Dynamo use in the office. And so, uh, we sat down and talked about, you know, what, what do we want to do with this with this new tool? Um, and the first task that came out were QC QA tasks, you know, clean up the model. And so very, very quickly uh, from that point of view, you know, a very, very simple routine to go out and grab uh, the line pattern families from all of the exports that we get from our um, consultants and going into the model and basically cleaning up all of the uh, import, 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 import uh, layers for these and using a lot of the code that's already out in the community for, um, you know, available through the forums and really just using what was already there. Uh, once I, I was able to figure out this piece, I immediately got uh, Nick's wish list, which was really one item long. <laughs> oh yeah, my nemesis. Because for whatever reason, uh, here at Spark, there I'm was curious to see what you think about this too. <laughs> uh, there was some issue with the uh, linear dimension styles in the models. There was a lot of garbage in the models. I, I think what happened: uh, somebody downloaded a uh, like some Joe Schmo user Revit user group added, installed it on their machine, and then it wreaked havoc on our models. There's dimension styles that be like one 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 two 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 two. Somehow that duplicates dimension styles, a system family like that that you cannot do in Revit, and I love the tick mark too. I don't know if you'll see it in here. I'll show you. It's like super secret tick mark, like some like programming bug that was in there, bomb that was in there. But yeah, it could it, purge unused would not use. That would not work. That, that's I don't remember the details, but that's on the list for 2018. Yeah. The, the super secret uh, tick mark is. Oh, cool. Well, we somehow <laughs> exposed it. <laughs> yeah. I've seen it before too. Yeah. The first one I haven't seen. Yeah, I've yeah. seen the super secret tick mark, and that, that actually is on the list. Oh, the routine, so. hilarious. But it would work its way into everything, and it would, yeah. Purge Unused did not work. Yeah. I would guarantee it wasn't in the model anywhere, but Purge Unused did not work. Yeah, and I guess I guess this is sort of my question to the group because I've gone to the Thornton Tomasettis and I've gone to the Adrian Smiths, and that's really my question to the group because. Is everyone here a genius in Dynamo already? <laughs> <laughs> because that's sort of the questions that I have. Because I, I want to reach out and, and you know and grab some 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 new knowledge and and I, I, you guys can raise your hand. Let me know you know who are the geniuses and we can sort of get get on your good side for the. Uh, but I want the group to to respond. Where are you in in your use of Dynamo? How comfortable are you with it? Are you using it on a daily basis at your firms? Uh, just kind of go through, and if you, you could pass the question to the next person, but uh, that's that's my question for the. Or maybe group. a raise of hands. Who, who feels like they're experts? <laughs> yeah, would be an ex. Nobody wants to. I mean, we, we use it yeah. on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We got, we've got offices everywhere, and there's projects everywhere that people are digging into it, and they're finding that automation is a good way to get you know column schedules, 
um, split columns, uh, automate some of these dimensioning or translate geometry from other platforms into it. So I'm not necessarily the, the super high end, like, you know, Archilab guy or Cloudwork, yeah. but you know, you get yourself around by just going to learn some of the Python scripts as well. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we tend to use it as much as we can. If we can say, if we can save three hours, yeah, then, right. Then right. That's that's useful. What about beginner level? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> Paul too. Okay. Everybody else is in between. Huh? And, and because and the reason why I asked is because uh, immediately after I got through the uh, dimension styles routine and was able to delete things out of the model, then every single thing I wanted to do was going to be a dynamo task, even if it wasn't related mm -hmm. to the it. So uh, we have a technical team here, and so one of the next one of the next tasks was basically getting all of the sheets created in our in our models through through Dynamo. So uh, we have you know a pretty standard title block like everybody else does, but just the ability just to do all of that sheet creation. Uh, you know, quickly uh, and, and efficiently, and begin to fill out you know information here in the drawing uh, title block. So that that was pretty exciting when you know when you start diving in and getting your feet really wet and really doing some of this some of this work uh, uh, and finding routines that are already out there, just using them and re, re engineering them or reverse engineering them. So that was that was pretty pretty great to uh, to go through those experiences and have and have so much of the excuse me so much of the work already done for you because the um, the tech team here had so much content already. Uh, the, uh, they've done so much work on getting all of these things worked out. Maybe Nikki could speak to some of the, the gains and the, and the pains of, of, what, of what has gone on because they have great content. Uh, Sheehan has a great library. They have a lot of families. They have cages already modeled out. Their unit struts, their hot out containments, all of those families are already made. They're already been vetted out and figured out. Uh, they have a lot of this information already completed in Excel, and we can write from Excel. We can take stuff away, put it back. Uh, so if you want, you know, maybe a couple seconds. Yeah, that's on. kind of the. <clears throat> we need that connector piece, you know, where you take the old school architect who's really used to Excel, comfortable in Excel, super intimidated by Revit. You know, can't go into Revit. Could if they wanted to, but you know, doesn't have that comfort level. And then we have super Revit users, you know, in their everyday, knocking that content out. And we want that bridge, you know, that connector piece between the two to keep them comfortable with the format they're used to using. You love Excel, that's fine. You know, we can put all that content into Revit uh, through Dynamo, build these, you know, we have really good deliverable lists. It, it's cheat sheets, you know, beyond belief here. You know, every kind of occupancy cheat sheet you can think of, any kind of drawing list, deliverable list cheat sheet, the content that should be on an SD sheet you know, life safety at SD should have X, Y, Z. You know, it's all in there. We just want to figure out how to get the content into the model through those forms, I guess I'll call them. Because then it's, you know, then everybody's working in the same playing field. You know, it's not recreating anything. Like you said, we don't want to spend another three hours to create the sheet list inside Revit. We want to pull it from a sheet list that's already been vetted out by a project manager. Things like that. And then, you know, the we have all, this whole kit of parts, you know, we have every every one of those um, images you were seeing, we have a really well-built library of families, but every time we start a project, we're either detaching a project from Central that's, you know, gone into CDs, and you know how it is when you get into CDs, the Revit models become a mess, you know, like you get duplicated families, you get those imported line types, you get all this junk that's just, it happens, you know, so I don't want to steal this thunder, but we, yeah, we have all these kit of yeah, parts. Yeah. That's, maybe that's a good transition to what we're going to show next. Yeah, and we want to utilize them yeah. more efficiently. And and that's what you saw in the in the images in the marketing photos. That there's your door, yeah. and there's yeah. the RPPs, yeah, the, the different uh, Unistrut, a lot of the security. Uh, uh, what is it? The biometric uh, scanner, biometric and readers, the, yeah. the card readers, and all that information. It's already there. Here's those RPPs in here. And it's always, um, you know. Some kind of pattern, like the the cages are set out like a six three six three, you know, and you can't. First of all, I hate array in Revit, and I don't want people to array a bunch of stuff. But I also don't want them to click a thousand times to drop something in. So you know, we're trying to think of how can we how can we map those those parameters out, the six three six three six three pattern, and then have Dynamo place those things for us or, or populate for us. 
Yeah, and before we get to that piece, of, we we now have a good roadmap for the tech team. We have a good a good piece of information to go back to them and say, you know, what do you guys want to do mm -hmm. with these routines? You know, insert the uh, shift parameters. You know, do you want to maybe rename some scope boxes? You want to you know clean up the model? You know, set up the typical uh, office bar or even the you know some of the stairs that we we have pretty standard stairs, so they would just be set up automatically because they're pretty standard stairs. Or some of the bigger tasks, copying all the details that we need into a project into the project, mm -hmm. or copying all of the different families that we need into the project. Yeah, we're really prototype driven here. Okay. You know, it's the Facebook or Equinix has their prototype, yeah. and they want to deploy it on all these different sites. You know, that's our challenge that they give us: how to do that efficiently, cleanly. Uh, again, detaching a model at 100% CDs and starting an SD doesn't feel right to me doesn't feel like the right starting point. You know, yeah, you have full-blown set of CDs, but again, there's all the junk in there and somebody, the height of this wall isn't right or the stair is off by, you know, everything in Revit is so precise and then when you model it yourself, if you're kind of new to Revit, everything's off a little bit sometimes if you don't really have a working dimension string that's got a tolerance of, you know, 256 of an inch because something could be off 256 of an inch in it filters down into the details, you know, you, you feel it come through the model. So we're trying to trying to get to a better starting point quickly. Because I should say the deadlines are insane. Yes. For a million and a half square foot data center, our challenge right now is to start and end full CDs in three months for a million and a half square foot data center. So we, this is why we're doing this. <laughs> and now, no. Yeah. Um, um, the, the, the last piece I, I guess I have to communicate to all of you is the, some of the lingo that we use because when we're talking about generation one, two, three, four, five, six, when we're talking about the mission critical facilities, uh, maybe I need to explain some of, the, some of the generation lingo. So this is a generation three data center. It's just a bar. Uh, the previous generations, the two and the one, were just tighter versions of the bar. You know, people didn't really know what the organization of the data center could be, how it could be made into something that was inviting and friendly. Mm -hmm. So in the past, they were just, you know, jam-packed as in, and on the site as, as tight as they could. The admin was just wherever they could put it, and nothing was really worked out as far as, you know, people working in that space, people not working in that space. Uh, this is the... Uh, Prototype now, the H building for Facebook. This is uh, generation six data center. This is the butterfly concept. So from, from our clients, we get some of these goals worked out for us. So the single, single search of truth, uh, as far as the common platform uh, bullet point there, uh, but really going to that last bullet point of a design once repeat many approach. I'm glad, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you guys are here. I'm pretty sure you all have stories. So according to the to the document I have here. So to increase the speed of design and, const and construction by reducing design variability, but they never really ever take that away. Even though it's a prototype, it's always evolving. changing, it's always yeah. evolving. It's gonna be the exact same this time. And Nothing yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I've been hearing that, you've been telling me that, and, and every time I look at a model, they're all, they're all different mm -hmm. than that. So yeah. So. So to build to build the that bar that 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 data center bar, um, I can't really do a lot of location based scripts. I can't just say just you know project project point here and just make a make a bar of, of geometry because what if these guys want to rotate the geometry? I mean this happens a lot with the admin. Um, so really really using sort of a, a not a not location. Um, a not location based system and this is really the, 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 the bulk of the questions that I have so I'm gonna make geometry I'm gonna set up a point system I could insert families on that point and now that I have that information in Revit I can then insert a lot of the uh, geometry so maybe create a wall I'm pretty sure you guys all know how to do all this stuff but some of my staff here needs to see some of this information so really just going through and creating a lot of the geometry. But what if they need to uh, rotate, rotate a lot of the information? So let's see. 
let me unfreeze some of these so I can get uh, a little more balls in here. Yeah, because these prototypes, they'll be, you know, it's the same bar, but depending on the orientation to the substation, sometimes data hall bar one wants to go on the north instead of the south, or if you want to call it top and bottom, which then, uh, you know, when they come out of the admin, they always want to know in every facility, if I turn right, I'm going to be going to data hall A. So then sometimes we have to mirror the admin or mirror the data hall bars. And to do that, again, going back to that detaching a model from central at 90% and trying to mirror everything that's annotated and dimensioned and, you know, you all mirror and not copy and it'll go in the same place, but then everything explodes, you know, that never works well. So then we're starting from scratch, essentially, or hacking our way through a really destroyed model that just got mirrored on itself along an axis and trying to reverse, Why did I freeze all of these? <laughs> trying to reverse engineer, you know, all the havoc that just happened. So if we can just tell the script, okay, in this case, you know, the point A, B, C, D is reversed, then we can build that geometry very quickly, cleanly, and then we have a really good starting point because, yeah, we have to annotate everything again, but at least the geometry is exactly the same as it was on the last go around. And we're not wondering if, you know, something is off a little bit or if, you know, I don't know, the, the walls themselves are detaching then from the roof that I mirrored, you know, all, it, it's always messy starting these things. So yep. we're trying, the whole concept here is to start cleanly. And I knew the, the I know the live demo was going to, was going to burn, <laughs> but, but, uh, but you guys, you guys get the gist of the information. Uh, you can start to see the, you know, the points are the data, are, are the hot oil containment, you know, our, our families have really precise ins insertion points. So we know the, the corner of that hot oil containment is going to be completely dead nuts on every time you know it's not somebody just copying or i don't know if you guys hate array as much as me i don't know why i hate array so much i think it's because it makes a model group and then i have to ungroup everything i don't know i don't like it yeah. but yeah this method is good and and the pattern you know you can't tell an array to go two feet three feet two feet three feet so this is helps us with those kind of uh situations This is how you lace things in dynamo. <laughs> <laughs> and, and nice they warned me about the live demo, but of course. Yeah, I, we were going to record all this. I have, I have to be brave. Uh. <laughs> well, to, go, to walk to walk through the routine. Obviously, this is pretty straightforward. So you know, creating rabbit elements, putting in the precast wall uh, by uh, wall by curve, and also creating a floor. But the other pieces really uh, is going through the model and creating the core IT piece uh, because we have all of the, here's some interior walls. We have all of the families already set up in, in the uh, in the template. So all of our all of our bridging of families for the pipes. Uh, you can see these in here. Let's see these. Uh, bridge. Uh, so the, the bridging piece here, uh, also basically setting up the situation where you can have uh, for this core IT piece, putting in some of the high lock containments, and just creating that system of points, uh, and really, really getting at creating the, the information that way. Uh, to not have to have the staff insert those points or insert that those those information you know by click by click uh, away. So I apologize for the live demo. I was I was confident it was going to be straightforward, but of course uh, you always get burned when you try to go live yeah. with a routine. Um, let me just let your wife froze all these. And I'm also wondering if there's a, a more efficient way to some, do some of these tasks because I'm basically just laying out a grid of points mm -hmm. and if there's a way to uh, maybe speed up some of this information so that it all grabs from a, from a more, more elegant way. So I apologize for all this. Uh, I'm not sure why. I think they get the idea. Yep. You know what we're trying to do. Yep. Uh, it works. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Cool. 
running this um, throughout the course of a, of a project or just when you're initially setting it up? So far we have not implemented this on a project, but our idea is this is how you start a project. Okay. So we give the tools to the, this is my, my dream, right? I give the tools to Chang. Chang decides that this data hall bar has, you know, it's, it's X amount wide, X amount long, it's got four data halls, I want my hot aisle containment this far apart. She plugs in all those parameters and it builds those data halls very quickly for her. Uh, same with the admin, you know, that, that's a little, you know, a, as you could tell, every admin has its own spin. So our concept is build the data hall bars and the skin and the core fast because that's what's the same everywhere. And then we get to spend more time on the admin, you know, that front porch, the, the different game snacks, rooms. All that. That's all standardized stuff. Very that standardized, very tried and true for them. Yeah, yep. They'll always, you know, we're always doing new prototype concepts for them, but yeah, when they, the, the H concept they're at now, you know, they, I don't know, like one every month, if not more than that. Now, are the racks the same for different clients, or does each client have their own? Look each client has their own kit of parts, their own kind of makeup of how things go, because they have their own networking schemes, you know. You separate family libraries for yes. each of these. Separate family libraries for each client, yep, yep. Yeah, the naming convention. You know, we're we're trying to standardize that. You could tell from those pull downs that our naming convention is still kind of all over the place. But really trying to stick to CSI format for naming conventions, so that way, you know, every time we're grabbing something, we're thinking about the specs, we're relating it to those building elements. I heard there's this tool called Dynamo that you can use to help rename things. Oh yeah. yes. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, my apologies for the for the very very rough yeah, there it is. rough. Uh, but to to really get at sort of doing the uh, the insertion through through the routines and so those so the set doesn't have to do a lot of this by hand mm -hmm. and giving them the controls to uh, to change some of these uh, some of these wall heights perhaps um, mm -hmm. and so that they can actually go in here and you know maybe they decide that they don't want that wall to be you know 15 feet they can change the the, the, the height of the wall. Yeah, because the floor to floors will, you know, they'll stay pretty steady, but then, you know, just like we we're saying, oh, it's going to be exactly the same, only this time we're going to have a split slab, and now we're going to change all the uh, penthouse units to mechanical units, we're not doing a passive system anymore, and then, you know, we're scrambling to delete out, change things, but if, you know, if we can just dial it in quickly with these, these uh, sliders, that's our goal. And the, go ahead. So did you say you're having a challenge with orientations of different, like as you, so you place everything based on a pattern, but you're having issues with orientations after. The challenge is, we're, it's the orientation, because the concept of just detaching from central and starting with that model, but then the model's not right. You know, the admin needs mirrored, this needs reversed or, or rotated 180 degrees. And to do that, you know, far down the road of, of CDs, it wreaks havoc. So our challenge is, one, to get the client to really give us that information right up front. What's the orientation? Where's the substation? You know, what's data hall one bar, data hall two bar? How are we orienting this thing? That's the challenge right up front for us. Once we get all those parameters locked down, we can use this to just quickly knock the data hall bars out modeling wise. Yeah. Uh, and, and those being the pieces of the bar, yeah, right there. Um, and then having to create um, <coughs> variations of the bar, but really it's the variations of the uh, of the admin, and having to work out uh, you know some other some other form of of organization to to then begin to change the order of that point system. So if you're going to have a, a north facing bar or south facing bar, east west mm -hmm. facing bar, or west facing bar. Uh, that, that will be the challenge to try to get that dial into how, how we create all those, those pieces. And so I guess I guess I've learned my lesson because the, the, the simple things is uh, they're very, very easy to do, but the elegant things are very, very hard to do. And that's some of the challenges that we're, that we're going through right now. Uh, I apologize for the live demo. I obviously should have recorded it. I, I'll take my 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 pill now, uh, because when, I, when we went to go see your presentation at TT, you guys recorded the uh, 
a lot of those running of the routines because you know I never know what might happen. So yeah, yeah. record first. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless you have it really, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So this is where we're at right now. Uh, I realize this is a team sport. We have a lot of staff interested in learning some of the tools and really getting them trained and really getting all that stuff started at the same time while we're doing it. this is really going to be key key to getting this uh this completed obviously i use the same resource everybody else uses to get familiar with the tool obviously the plural sites and the dynamo bin that orgs of, of the uh of the world out there um really i want to have a good discussion obviously we have some time but i don't want to take too much time because we want to give you guys some time on the vr uh, there are a couple projects loaded on the vr so if you guys want to keep Drinking, eating, chatting, but uh, we do have that for you guys. I want to give you guys time during this block of time to do some of that. So if you guys have any other discussion points, maybe Paul can throw a, a starter or yeah? No yeah. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I already asked some questions. Yep. Um, I think I think I, I like I like the approach there. So if I understood you were saying What's happening now is people are taking old projects and saving as to start a new project, and that's where all these problems are coming in. So instead, if you can build the smarts in that you know, like all the preset variables that you know are unlikely to change right. into a Dynamo script, then that's a much better starting point. I think right. I would tend to agree. If mirroring a project, rotating a project, that's just never a good idea. Especially no what phase it is right, in. right. <laughs> it's okay. Like I've, I've done it like right off the bat in right SD away. when they change the name, mines right away. Still, not yeah, it's not just, helpful, but it never goes well. No. Um, so now, I guess I would throw this out there. Maybe anyone who who might have tried this, I recall them saying um, in one of the most recent versions of Dynamo that they now have like all these nodes for annotation. So I wonder oh, yeah. oh, great. if the next logical phase, once you get that pinned down a little bit, is yes. some of the standard. If we could annotate the data bar, yeah. data hub bar. That, exactly. Yes. And has anybody yeah. played with the new annotation nodes? There was like something supposedly like 100 new nodes or something in the latest release. Yeah, you have. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. You should probably definitely do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dimensions too? Or? Yeah, yeah. But, you can do it differently. Yeah. I would go uh, add to that comment. You can probably do a. A Revit node, I mean a Dynamo node that already has predefined parameters like width, <coughs> length, uh, type of space. So you create a matrix and then the user can input those and then generate some sort of output that yeah. they can plug it into the racks and, and your predefined systems and then you find something there. So you're okay. suggesting they'd almost make like their own package or something? Yeah, kind of for their own firm. So like, yeah. okay, so I got. Uh, building a that's like rotating north with spaces with 50 by 100 yeah. with um, atrium at the entrance. So you start building your surfaces that you built for the racks and stuff like that. Since you yeah. already have the rate, the arrays, and you already have the history and the yeah, yeah, we know we all, yeah, we all got all that stuff. parameters all okay. mapped out. Yeah, I think that's something that we've done previously where we're doing um floor framing analysis and uh, it's very typical for bay so if we can define the bay area right so typical 25 by 50 or whatever yeah, so yeah, yeah, right. loads and spacing of rooms then we can get some pretty fast uh, sizes of the, of the framing so it's like okay just those are just parameters that the engineer annotated right right so yeah saves time it's good to know Any other questions? Yeah, Billy? Uh, was I first? Or was I? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. So, um, I'm Billy the, uh, with ESD, private coordinator. Uh, so I have, I'm wondering if, if it's possible to draw ductwork using Dynamo. Mm -hmm. I don't it's like, it's like, okay, you can build yeah. walls and array equipment, but is it possible to draw ductwork through a uh, segment path? Like you, you can draw it, say, in CAD, and use this line in Dynamo to generate the actual uh, ductwork. Yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a MEP plugin uh, add-ins for that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. It, uh, I mean, you you'll have to generate the path. Yeah. If in it, if it's you know some sort of weird shape, then how do you define that? You would probably define that parametrically. Okay. Or if you have something. Uh, Rhino model with lines, and then you can translate it 
to a path. Okay. But I don't know, that was one of the questions that we got sometimes. I was like, I don't know. The other one was beam penetrations as well. And what oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that was something that it was, it's, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. To locate there the penetration is. itself. Yeah. We, we can generate the penetrations. Uh, but if we don't, if you don't have a three D model of uh, the MEP and the location, then it's pretty hard. Oh uh, yeah. The ones <laughs> you can get at them. That's that's useful for everybody. <laughs> uh, what is the name of the uh, the add-on? I don't know. I can't remember. Just look from uh, there in the packages. Okay. Yeah. We use a lot of Rhino. Yeah, for the. The, you know the design portions of the admin. Um, let's see, we, we use 3ds Max as well for some of the visualization things. But uh, yeah, Rhino in conjunction with Revit is usually the construction document software that we use. And is there a point when you stop using Rhino and just switch to Revit, or are you always using both of them? Uh, yeah. Once I mean, once the design is, I mean, maybe Stephen and Chang can talk to that. They they definitely use Rhino more than me, but. Yes, I mean, I would say that our use of more for um, modeling geometry quickly. So it's like, you know, geometry that is unique per project. Um, whereas, you know, the data hall bars are typically going to be, you know, hopefully generated through that one. They're kind of like similar. And then, you know, there's like a new facade system or, you know, some kind of like feature design piece that'll happen pretty quickly in Rhino and then that's brought in. So it's kind of like, you know, as those things change, they can be kind of go back to Rhino, work it out, bring things back in. It's kind of been the workflow. Yeah, we use a lot of um, Grasshopper um, in Rhino. And it's, it's our, <coughs> our use of, usage of it is mainly been for sort of facade studies, facade articulations. And we have some um, interior specialty ceiling treatments and whatnot that we also kind of use it for as well. But for, um, you know, like everyone else is saying, all of the the data hall and any sort of interior sort of um, wall partitions or anything like that. That we, we typically keep that in Revit because the challenge that we have is going from we like the fluidity of working in Rhino and in Grasshopper, but when we go we, when we bring that geometry into Revit, we're bringing it in essentially as like dumb geometry. We in our office we haven't found a way yet to um, make that a live weapon object that you can begin to control the thickness of things in the way that you know you can like still like you know if you were to model a wall in Revit it would have all these built in parameters and yeah. you would still be able to populate um, with smart information. So. Yeah other than that um, you know I really like the ID8 plugins just for efficiencies you know there for you know, managing models, um, and then quite a few plugins for the VR uh, uh, work we've been trying to do. Fuser is our the app we've really liked uh, in the last couple of weeks. We've discovered Fuser; it's a great one for VR. Yeah, I think I think um, on the facade plus, I think you could probably um, benefit from the Flux or some of the other plugins strictly um, connected to Grasshopper and Rhino geometry. And you can generate your facade panel, panels, or facade schemes, or whatever more intelligently. Instead of just being, you know, Revit, uh, sand or whatever it is. Right. Yeah, that's so, what we've got now. Yeah. 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 I think that then becomes sort of like a whole, you know, workflow that you generate from Crossover uh, yeah. directly into, into Revit and Dynamo. And then, you so know, you, that uh, there's a couple of them. Um, there's Dynamo. <laughs> Uh, it's an add-in for um, Dynamo, and then there's Flux IO. Uh, maybe I should get paid for this. <laughs> you should give me some. Well, we're hiring. Hey, we're hiring. So. <laughs> is that the Google so, plugin? Google, Google Flux IO? Uh, it, it's out of Google. Yeah, it's yeah. prone out of Google, and uh, now they're uh, their own. So we, we had them come speak a couple, yeah. couple sessions ago. <clears throat> Probably about six months ago now. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was almost tempted to have them come in again because I saw some announcement recently that they did something new, and I, you know, I don't know. If people are interested in that. I could reach out to them again. Yeah, we definitely would be trying to make. Yeah, just like Chang said, right now it's you know a dumb set file that comes into Revit. We can add a keynote to it maybe or something. But yeah, 
kind of lose that fluidity of, of design. We, we usually need to go both ways to bring um, rhino stuff in, into Revit, and it comes in pretty intelligently. But also, if someone is building a Revit model that needs to see, say, a core that someone else is building in Revit, we can bring that into the rhino model. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right now 17 has allowed you to bring in uh, Rhino models, uh, and then you're going to assign them uh, specific you know, generic families or a partition or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I think they still want to be a little bit dumb <laughs> in the sense. Yeah, yeah, like yeah you were saying the cat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, but it's good if you're like a concept designer or something like that when you want to get things yeah, messed yeah, up yeah. with coordination. Yeah, I think it's good. Yeah, I don't think it's a round trip thing. I think you just have to re-import it because it's import, it's not link. Uh, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a step in the right direction, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, the, the indications. I mean, if you read the public roadmap for Autodesk that has published on Revit, and if you look at what they released in seventeen point one in twenty eighteen. There's an awful lot of movement in the interoperability space. You know, uh, we had the Rhino or the Rhino import. Uh, you know, they added to that in 2018, where it can be scheduled and tagged. And then uh, now they've got the coordination model. They're calling it, where you can bring a Navisworks in as just sort of a visual thing. Again, these things are really kind of weak in terms of they're not round trip. You're not yeah. you can't even snap to the, to the coordination yeah. model. But it's like the fact that they're doing these things. Uh, to me, says that Autodesk understands that we need more interoperability with other file formats, so we don't just live in one in one Revit model, and that's the only place that people are working. So I I applaud the effort. I hope they continue with it. I hope they take it a lot further. Yeah, we'll see. You know, you know how that goes sometimes with Autodesk. They right. come out fast and furious, and then they get bored and they move on to the next thing. And so I'm hoping they won't do that like here. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah. any other questions? I have a question about the uh, how's Escape on the VR. Yeah, Enscape. Enscape. Yeah. Enscape is we like Enscape because of I think Arrow can talk to this more. He does have his PhD in visualization, but um, <laughs> the global illumination it looks really good, right? Mm -hmm. You feel like you're in the space, but there's no option to click on something and get the metadata. There's no uh, markup tool. There's no you know I want to know what. What's the width of this corridor? Is it code compliant? I can't do that in Enscape. Oh no! But I get a really good idea of what the space is going to look like. Is there a tool that allows you to do that? Yeah, Fuser, the one I was talking about, the add-in Fuser. Uh, it's definitely on the more expensive side, but I think it's because it does everything. You know, it does expose the metadata. Uh, it's a gaming engine. We can freely walk around anywhere we want to go. It exposes the metadata from Revit. Um, it's a real-time connector to Revit, so. Uh, Somebody could be in editor mode in VR and be in the space and you know, shoot themselves over to another space in your Revit model, you're in the floor plan, you go to that space. They say, you know, shorten that counter up by two feet, let me see what that looks like. You do it real time, it, it does it real time. They can, you can also mark things up. Um, people see what you're seeing, that's a big deal to us with VR. If they can't, if I can't see what you're seeing, it's very clumsy to try to explain well okay maybe turn around or do you see the do you see the red silo over here in the in the lobby um, that gets really clunky so presentation wise that works a lot better um, anything else that I missed there escape is very good because I don't know how they do it but the, even if you bring in a very heavy model oh yeah it's, it's cruising it's, yeah I think it's just a mesh poly right it's just a JPEG on top of the of a Three mesh, whatever face. That's what usually game engines do. Even the do. geometry, even if it's like without materials, we are bringing like millions of polygons inside. It's yeah. so fast. It's amazing how they do it. So, so you, imagine like a very good viewer. Do you think fuse, fusion? Fuse? Fuser. 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 Yeah. Is better. Yeah. yeah you, Fuser you is. Have... It's a more complete package. More complete package. Complete yeah. Complete yeah. Package. But it doesn't have global illumination. It doesn't look quite as good as Enscape. <laughs> yeah, you know, Enscape looks real yeah, good. Especially, well, you got to build really good materials in Revit, which we've yeah, we got challenge. pretty good material. Creating everything up front. Well, somebody should buy each other, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is, is there a plugin for Rhino? Fuser is multi It takes courses for Rhino, Rhino, 3ds Max, um, 3ds Max right? AutoCAD 3D. SketchUp, it's like everything, yeah. basically. Yeah. Escape is only Revit and SketchUp right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, prospect from Iris, Iris is, VR, 
the materials don't look really great, but you can. Uh, well, we like Fuser now. You know, Fuser kind of took the bar for us. You know, now we kind of discarded uh, Prospect because Fuser does pretty much everything we want. Um, another cool thing, um, you know, Facebook owns Oculus. They're really pushing us to use Oculus. Their people can have an Oculus room. We have our Oculus room set up over there. But uh, we can go as avatars into the space and walk around and talk to each other about what we're seeing real time. Is that time. what you do with Facebook? Not yet, but we're very excited to try that <laughs> with Facebook. <laughs> yeah, we just got a third sensor. That's why there's now the option to, before, if I move my head, nothing happened in VR, right? And that felt weird. If I crouched down, it didn't crouch down. If I had a gaming engine, I could crouch down and I could try to match it up. And that made me personally very nauseous and other people get very nauseous when they use VR because those two planes are not in sync. Uh, now that we can move and we could act, I mean, I was sticking my head inside a server cabinet and it knew that I was going inside that server cabinet. So when you can triangulate yourself like that, that goes a long way as well. We do like the HTC Vive. We're going to get one of those as well. <laughs> but we got to have the Oculus because we work for Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Harold, can you stand up? If you guys or have wait. any questions, <laughs> Harold is right there. We have a station yeah. for everybody to try out. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. You guys yeah, we got the Oculus Touch. That's that's helped quite a bit as well because, you know, you can shoot yourself into another space. That's how you grab something to look at the metadata. Um, we went to a VR conference out in uh, Vancouver, Canada. There was all kinds of, you know, software folks out there doing just that. You know, that one had the anatomy of a dog you could and it, you could think of it as a building for sure you know layers of a building layers of a dog you could take their skin off take the muscles off take the all the way down to the bone grab a bone pull it out you know look at the bone in vr then on off to the side was all the metadata of that bone what bone was it uh what system was a part of i don't know anything about anatomy i'm just making this up but whatever <laughs> you know everything you'd want to know about that you could just think of that as a building. You know, we always use that analogy of, of layers, or you know, the the body as a building, the skin of the building, the you know, the core structure of the building. So we were really excited to meet those guys and got their business What's cards. Zoo Lab? Uh, Zoo Lab, I think. Do you remember those guys' names? Uh, like Llama. Llamas or something. Sorry. Hey, Sorry. <laughs> 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 they got to work on the news. Right <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, the AC industry was represented pretty well there, but we were about 15% of the people that were there. Heavy gamers, you know, heavy gaming industry. Um, yeah, a lot of military stuff done in VR. The coolest setup we saw was the um, a completely untethered. Uh, system. The, the helmet was enormous. Uh, I mean, it was all a prototype. They had just finished it the night before, but heavy 4K graphics, all done wirelessly. Uh, but that's for, you know, they have a, a room set up the size of this room with, with sensors and they have fake guns and they're going in and they, they want to really know, like when I pulled that trigger, did I pull the trigger at the right time in their minds? What did I, you know, was I overzealous? You know, that kind of stuff they were doing with VR, but Pretty fun uh, conference. If you have to leave right at the end of the meeting here, please go first. If you can stay <laughs> after the meeting, please let the other people go first. Yeah. But uh, we're set up over there. You can there. tinker with the the VR to me is yeah. another one we like. Um, it's a browser based thing. You, anybody with a browser can use it. That's the one that's on the Microsoft Studio next to Arold, so you can use that one as well. Why people use the headset? But. How, how much was the setup? For the Oculus, for the, uh, yeah, for the um, sensors. Yeah. The sensors are about seventy-five bucks. I think all in, that's about eight hundred dollars of tech. But you need to see the laptop that we have is VR ready, Oculus ready. So you have to have at least three USB imports. You want the HDMI next to the USB import. If you go over and look at the tech, you'll kind of see all that. We even had to get a USB extender because of the third sensor. Um, and then the, uh, obviously the video card, you know, we got a 1080, what's, what chip do we have there? 1080M. That was like the top of the line a year ago and it sort of looks good. That's what we take when we travel. De his desktop has the Titan, whatever, the top of the line video card. It looks really choice there, but that does a good job though, that laptop. Yeah. So it won't work on my desk. 
<laughs> no, no. You're gonna have to push your boss to get you a nice workstation. Yeah, we are. We're now investing in box workstations. Um, do you know about BOXX? They're pretty good uh, tech um, hardware company. Yeah, we've uh, we have a rendering farm from them, and now we're starting to invest in the workstations, mainly for the up heavy duty CPU and video cards. Have you done Dynamo in Revit with live VR at the same like have that all? No, ready no, go? no, we haven't done that yet. That'd be cool though to lace in VR. Right. <laughs> See you can see it happen around you. Around to see you. that burst. Yeah, to see that burst. Yeah, I wonder if anybody's layout. thought of that. Like I don't know. Like, yeah, 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 right. That'd be cool. They have a grasshopper, though. Okay. <laughs> One guy from uh, Oh, yeah? MBG. He was scripting in VR? Yeah, he's like the guy who makes all this weird stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. He's pretty into this thing, and he was like using that thing to control the height. You can do your sliders. Uh, and yeah. Yes. 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 At that <laughs> same conference, they, there was another company... Um, I'm not going to remember the name, but I, I was able, it felt very much like SketchUp. I was able to draw a plane in VR with the, yeah. this was the Vive touch, but then I could extrude it. I could cut an opening. I could draw stairs. Very SketchUp though, right? Like very schematic kind of design, but it was kind of cool to model in VR and be inside the space as you model. So pretty cool. Please, please. Go yeah. Ahead. Somebody, yeah, somebody yeah. looks silly for two minutes.